Now we move ahead nearly 2,000 years to Renaissance Italy and the work of Niccolo Machiavelli. Like Aristotle, Machiavelli lived in a city-state undergoing traumatic political changes in a world of conflict and instability. Machiavelli's response to this turmoil was to seek the foundational principles of politics. His key insight, the insight that has made Machiavelli's work controversial for centuries, is that politics is the business of creating and enforcing social stability. And in pursuit of this end, all manner of violence, deceit, and treachery must be accepted as the tools of political action. For the ancients, city life was political life. The only politics that mattered were those of the city, from the citadels to the temples to marketplaces. But under the feudal system of medieval Europe, power was centered in the countryside, in the estates and castles of powerful landowners and their private armies. In the period between roughly 500 AD and 1000 AD, cities across the former Roman Empire declined in size, power, and importance relative to the countryside. One of the few exceptions to this trend was northern Italy, where ancient cities like Florence, Milan, Pisa, and Genoa maintained a tradition of urban political life throughout the Middle Ages. Until about 1100 AD, these cities were under the nominal rule of the Holy Roman Emperors, who confusingly enough were based in Germany. But following a civil war among the German princes, the Italian cities threw off imperial rule and established themselves as independent communes. These city-states underwent a remarkable course of development in the High Middle Ages, which peaked in the period from 1400 AD to 1600 AD that we call the Renaissance. Like the polis, the communes were independent and self-sufficient, with heavily urbanized populations and correspondingly complex social and political institutions. But the ideologies that informed the thinking of the commune citizens and the history that shaped their institutions were radically different than those that shaped the polis. The Italian communes were intensely aware of their history as prosperous cities of the Roman Empire, a long past period of glory and power whose reminders were everywhere in Italy. This glorious past contrasted with the medieval Italian experience of disunity, warfare, and foreign rule. The communes were also steeped in the intense religiosity of the Middle Ages. The Roman Catholic Church exercised enormous power in both religious and political life. Everyday life was steeped in religious ritual, and in many cities, bishops exercised direct political power. The Pope in Rome, the head of the church, was as much a political ruler as the Vicar of Christ. Crucially, these cities were deeply invested in long-distance trade, dominating the European trade routes with Islamic societies and the distant ports of the Indian Ocean. This commitment to commerce led to several pioneering developments in the Italian communes. Genoese sailors were the first to expand European overseas trade into the Atlantic, while in Florence, merchants eager to capitalize on their trading monopolies founded the first banks and laid some of the crucial foundations of capitalism. The prosperity of the Italian communes depended on their successful competition with rival cities, and in the absence of a central Italian government, warfare was common. In the constant struggle for power and prestige, cities developed different regimes. In some cases, a single ruler with sufficient military and financial backing could rule alone, so long as he jealously defended his position from rivals. These are the princes that Machiavelli is going to focus on. In other cities, long-standing oligarchies managed affairs, and in some cases, governed with the support of urban workers and artisans. But in all cases, complex webs of familial, religious, and political ties tended toward instability and conflict. One family of particular interest to us is the Medicis of Florence. First rising to prominence as bankers, the Medicis leveraged their wealth to assume control of the city government, and a long line of Medicis ruled Florence, kings in all but name. Niccolo Machiavelli spent his life immersed in this chaotic political world. Born into a well-to-do family in the commune of Florence, Machiavelli received a humanist education devoted to the Greek and Roman classics. He then served as a Florentine diplomat, representing the city at various European courts. Machiavelli served the Florentine Republic, which had been established in 1494, just as he was beginning his political career. In 1494, the French king Charles VIII invaded Italy. 
The Medici ruler of Florence, Piero the Unfortunate, surrendered the city to the French, and once they had departed, Piero was overthrown by a popular revolt. Encouraged by a radical Dominican monk, Girolamo Savonarola, the Florentines established a republic marked by religious enthusiasm and grandiose dreams of Florentine domination of Italy. But Savonarola's radicalism alienated the city's elites, rival communes, and the Pope in Rome. Savonarola was arrested by the republic's rulers and burned at the stake. Years of warfare across Italy followed and ended with the destruction of the republic and the restoration of Medici rule. Machiavelli was purged following the Medici restoration and retired to private life in the countryside, where he wrote his major works on politics, The Discourses on Livy and The Prince. The Prince is written in the style of a genre common to Renaissance Europe, the mirror for princes. The idea was that hereditary rulers needed all the help they could get in managing the affairs of state, and mirrors for princes presented words of wisdom and counsel, often drawn from ancient or biblical examples. An expert on the Roman Republic and a sharp observer of contemporary politics, Machiavelli relied on classical and modern examples of political wisdom and folly to guide rulers toward the ultimate goal of a strong, stable state. The Prince was written as part of Machiavelli's attempt at rehabilitation, addressed to Lorenzo de' Medici in the hopes that he would take Machiavelli's advice to heart and restore his position as a senior diplomat. But this was not to be, and instead the Prince became one of the most notorious works in the canon of political theory. Indeed, we often think of the term Machiavellian as an insult, a way of describing amoral, cynical, and selfish behavior by politicians willing to use any means necessary to advance themselves. We owe much of this view to the Elizabethans. Shakespeare regularly referred to Machiavels as examples of sinister evil, of violence in the service of personal ambition. This totally misreads Machiavelli's intentions. Machiavelli saw himself as a realist, and he insisted that in order to successfully practice politics, the prince, or the would-be prince, had to begin by accepting the world and its people as they are, not as the prince might wish them to be. In this sense, Machiavelli is intensely anti-utopian. He is not interested in worrying about how things ought to be. Instead, he focuses absolutely on how things are. All successful politics starts from this commitment to accepting the world on its own terms. This realism helps explain his attitude toward religion. In medieval political thought, legitimate political authority was associated with moral goodness. Rulers were to be obeyed because they displayed religious virtue. Power and morality were closely connected concepts. Machiavelli demolishes this assumption. He insists that the virtues that make for a religiously upright life are incompatible with the virtues demanded by politics. Faith, hope, and charity might help secure an individual's salvation in the eyes of God, but in politics, those virtues are vices, and their practitioners more often than not end up dead. Think of the pious Savonarola, who Machiavelli calls an unarmed prophet, burned at the stake. Instead, Machiavelli begins with the virtues suited to politics, virtues rooted in the pagan Roman past that were revived in the Renaissance. For Machiavelli, virtues like strength, courage, pride, and when necessary, ruthlessness. These are the virtues necessary for establishing and maintaining a strong state, a state in which men can live in security and pursue the distinction and the fame that Machiavelli thinks all people crave. It is worth noting that, in true realist style, Machiavelli thinks a smart prince encourages religious piety on the part of his people without necessarily practicing it himself. After all, a common religion helps unite the citizenry and keep the city cohesive. Whether religion is true or false, it is a useful form of social control that contributes to the ultimate goal of political stability. This can look like cynicism or hypocrisy, but Machiavelli was entirely in earnest. Questions of morality or right or wrong are simply irrelevant to politics as Machiavelli understands it. Instead, Machiavelli focuses on what he sees to be human nature. This nature is a constant for Machiavelli. It does not change depending on historical development or location in the world. It is basically the same everywhere and always. This is why Machiavelli is so comfortable drawing on historical examples. What men did in the past, and how they did it, can in principle be applied to any modern-day situation. 
This is why, when Machiavelli discusses the special problems of founding a new state, he regularly refers to ancient founders like Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, and Theseus. The lives of these men, mythological or not, are of particular importance to princes, since these men achieve the goals Machiavelli believes all princes share. Through sheer force of will and cunning, they founded states, destroyed their enemies, and altered the course of history. This is one of the rarest feats in history, and Machiavelli is obsessed with these figures because he hopes to see a founder figure like this emerge in Italy, and united in the same way, for example, that Romulus united the first Romans. Once the scale of the prince's task is clear, Machiavelli's recommended tactics begin to make a harsh kind of sense. Machiavelli tells us that humans respond to both kindness and terror, but for the prince, the safest route is to pursue terror. Treat your people too softly, and they will think you soft. A reputation for ferocious violence can guard a prince better than a private army. But a prince cannot use terror indiscriminately. Too much violence will alienate the people as surely as softness. Fear is useful for a prince, but not hatred. Subordinates who fear you will serve you well. Subordinates who hate you will undermine you every chance they get. The population over which a prince rules should, as far as possible, be kept poor and on constant military alert. This will bond the people more closely to the ruler, so long as the ruler appears as a great leader strong enough to beat back the city's enemies. When you reward subordinates with favors or benefits, do it yourself. But when the state needs dirty work done, make sure that the blood is on hands other than your own. If you must take drastic action... If you must eliminate rivals or sack a city, do it quickly and decisively. Don't drag it out. Nothing binds a people more closely to their prince than success. Forget piety or magnanimity or kindness. What people love is a winner. In short, violence and terror and bloodshed are the normal, legitimate tools of politics. But to wield these tools well requires exceptional talent. Machiavelli's willingness to face reality and act accordingly has made him a uniquely controversial figure in the history of modernity. But this is the source of his appeal. Machiavelli's blunt, hard-nosed attitude compels us to respond, and the importance of the questions he raises confront us every time we observe political conflict. Is there room for morality in politics? Under what circumstances can we say that the ends justify the means? Perhaps most importantly, in our time, there is a strong taboo against political violence. We have seen this demonstrated in the response to the mass protests against police brutality and the sporadic violence at their margins. If violence is central to politics, then when is it appropriate to use? In 2020 America, who gets to use violence with a clean conscience and who does not? Machiavelli forces us to face up to these questions, even if the answers are hard to come to terms with.